Hey guys, so I want to talk about complex dynamics for the rest of the class. Um, we'll come back to the zeta function when we have a chance to uh, do it justice in the seminar that we'll do next quarter. Um, for now, I think it's a good idea to shift gears into another sort of elementary area of complex analysis, and that is the area of complex dynamics. And that's going to be the study of the iteration of uh, complex functions on themselves. The set of notes that we're going to be following uh, for this portion of the course are by Roland Roeder. Uh, the notes are called Around the Boundary of Complex Dynamics. They were written for a summer research project for undergraduates. Um, and uh, they're very nicely written. They include exercises. I will be augmenting this with uh, ideas of my own and suggestions for, uh, for further research as we go on. I will be providing uh, Mathematica notebooks that can be worked through. Um, there are other tools that can be used to visualize the sort of things that we're going to be studying that do not require the use of uh, Mathematica. Um, if I do give you a Mathematica notebook, they will be pre-built for you to play around with. Um, I'm not going to require anybody in here to write their own code for this, but if you would like to write code that extends the ideas that we're going to be talking about here, that's awesome. So the basic idea of complex dynamics is that we're going to start with some function f of x. Well, since we're in complex analysis, we should write z instead of uh, f. So this is some function on c. And then we're going to have some sort of seed or initial point. And usually we'll call that z naught. And we're going to be looking at what are called the iterates of f. Um, and those are things like f of f of z. So we're basically taking f and repeating it on itself. So we have some point z0 that we start with. We apply f and we get f of z0. We apply f again and we get f of f of z0, and so on. And what we're studying is the behavior of how this evolves as we uh, move forward in time or with, uh, with repeated application. And it's easy to imagine that these get sort of hard to, uh, to write down once you have lots of Fs being applied together. Um, so, uh, so a notation that gets used sometimes uh, is we might say that Zn is equal to F. And I'm going to write a little circle N up here of z naught, and you should think of this as n compositions of f. So compose f n times, and then apply it to this initial point z naught. Okay, so the sequence z naught, z one, z two, z three, and so on, which if you remember, is z naught, f of z naught, f of f of z naught, f of f of f of z naught, and so on. This is also called the orbit of z naught under f. Now, one nice function uh, that we might look at to start with that sort of gives us an idea of how things get off the ground here um, is we can look at uh, a linear function. So let's define the linear function L from C to C by L of Z is equal to AZ or some complex number a. Um, I'm going to point out here, and this is a place to be cautious, so I will write caution. Something like f of x is equal to, maybe not x, something like f of z is equal to az plus b is not linear because f of 0 is not equal to 0. Okay, so we're using linear in the sense of complex analysis here. Um, maps that don't go through the origin but have the structure of lines are called affine maps. So we would call f is 
an affine map. Okay, so an important caveat here to be careful of. Um, we have a name for the, the number a, so the constant a is called a parameter. And we can think about it as sort of a dial or control for the behavior of the orbit of our initial point. So a uh, describes a particular system or evolution, right? So the orbits will change as I choose different values of a. So how so? Well, let's just look at um, some different starting values of, uh, of our sequence, and then we will look at some different values of A. So suppose we have something like uh, the linear function L of Z is equal to 1 half of Z. So how does that act? Um, I could probably make a more interesting value than that because what L of Z is equal to 1 half Z is going to do is just going to have whatever the radius of Z is. So we could draw ourselves a little plot over here. Then we can imagine that if we started with a point, say, out here, and we, it's useful in a lot of these cases to think about the r e to the i theta form of these things. So imagine out here we had something like 2e to the i pi over 4. Well, if I think about what the orbit of that point is, if I take l of 2e to the i pi over 4, I get e to the i pi over 4. And the second application of L to 2e to the i pi over 4 is equal to 1 half of e to the i pi over 4. And L of that number will be 1 quarter of e to the i pi over 4. And so what we can see is that what's happening here is that along this line, we have this sequence of points. So this is z naught. This is z1, which happened at e to the i pi over 4. And we can look at um, z2, which is 1 half of e to the i pi over 4. And we're marching down this towards this point at 0. So we can think about 0 here. z equals 0 is sort of attracting that point in. And in fact, if we choose a different value of, uh, of a, um, we can see that uh, we're going to get the same sort of behavior. I mean, this is pretty easy behavior because no matter where you start, if you start on, say, a point right here, this is pretty easy to predict what's going to happen since all of the A is doing is having the radius each time. And so the sequence of points is going to march in to zero. If we choose a more interesting function, um, you recall that we talked about lines as consisting of uh, rotations and magnifications. Um, we're not dealing with translations because we don't have affine maps here. If we looked at something like L of Z is equal to uh, one third e to the i pi over 3, and we looked at the action of that map, so we drew another axis, and we're going to think about how this thing behaves. So let's start with maybe a sequence that looks like, oh, I guess I should put a z on here so it's a function, not constant. Then our initial point that we might consider, uh, maybe we'll consider something like, I don't know, 3. And if we apply L to 3, so we divide it by 3, and then we multiply e to the pi over 3, so we get 1 e to the i pi over 3. 
and then we apply L again, and we get 1 third e to the i 2 pi over 3. And we apply L again, and we end up with 1 ninth e to the i pi. And what you'll find in this case is that as you come around, we started at the point 3, then we rotated out to the point here at pi over 3. We had an angle of 2 pi over 3 and an angle of pi. And as I continue adding multiples of pi, if you think about it and calculate a few more points, what you'll see is we're having the radius, or we're thirding the radius each time. So the first time it was 3, the second time it's 1, the next time it's 1 third, the next time it's 1 ninth. And what we're getting here is this sort of spiral in where we're tracking around, and eventually what's going to happen is we're going to curl into the point at 0. And likewise, if I started with a different point, we're going to get the same sort of behavior. If I started with a point, say, 9 at pi over 4, so 9 pi over 9e to the i pi over 4, and I keep repeating or iterating this by L, I apply L once, and I get 3e to the i Oh man, okay, pi over 3 plus pi over 4 is 4 and 3, which is 7 pi over 12. I don't know why I did that to myself. And then I go one more time, and I'm going to get uh, divide by 3 again. And I'm going to have an e to the i 11 pi over 12. And if I apply L again, I'm going to end up with uh, 1 third e to the i 15 pi over 12. And what you're going to find here is that in this case, again, we're going to get um, some iteration here. We've got a pi over 4. We're going to end up at this angle. And uh, we have something that looks like this, and something that looks like this. And if we think about what our sequence is doing here, we start out here at 9, so imagine way out here at 9, and then in to 3, and then 1, and then 1 third. And so again, we're sort of spiraling in to the point at 0. So you can imagine that you keep coming around. Okay. So this number, if this number in modulus is less than 1, so the point of these pictures is that um, if you have an L of z is equal to az, and the modulus of a is less than 1, then 0 is an attracting point. That is, orbits spiral in to zero. Likewise, if you had L of z was equal to az, and the modulus of a was bigger than 1, then orbits spiral away from 0. And finally, if L of z is equal to az and the modulus of a is equal to 1, then uh, points just slide around in a circle. Points rotate in a circle. And the 
the special thing about zero here um, that might not be immediately obvious is that you notice that uh, L of zero is equal to zero, which means every iterate of L on zero is equal to zero. So the orbit of zero is zero, 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 forever. Um, another name for a condition where you put in a number and you get the same number out is zero is what's called a fixed point for the function. So zero is a fixed point for L of z is equal to az because zero goes in, zero comes out. Okay, so normally, normally, in dynamical systems, in dynamics, you get different behavior based on different initial points. So normally, uh, so for a linear map, basically, the only thing that controlled the behavior of the system was a parameter. So for linear maps, the parameter a is all that controlled the behavior of orbits. We're going to be looking at a much more interesting family of, of maps uh, that don't seem like they're that much more complicated. We're going to look at a special family of quadratic maps. Of the form f of z is equal to z squared plus c. c is going to be the parameter. And it's going to be the case that for these quadratic maps, both the parameter and the initial point are going to dictate long-term behavior. That is, different initial points are going to give us different orbits that do different things. They might stay bounded and spiral in. They could be unbounded and run away to infinity. They could bounce back and forth in cyclic behavior. There's all kinds of complicated behaviors that can arise even in the case of um, these basic quadratic maps. So let's look at an example quickly, um, and then we'll end this first video just to try to convince you that some interesting things are going on here. Because uh, we're going to basically be going to be focusing on this particular family of maps for the next section of the class, if you look at um, uh, in the Raider notes, Raider de designates fz, uh, z squared plus c, by just saying pc of z is the particular polynomial that is z squared plus c. So the c down here just designates that you've got that in uh, the place of C down here. So if you look at the map P, uh, let's do I over 4 of Z, which is equal to Z squared plus I over 4, we can look at a couple of different iterates of this function. And um, I'm going to try to draw a picture. This picture corresponds to um, uh, a particular image that we see in, in uh, Rotor's notes, and I'm going to uh, reproduce this in code for you guys. Um, I welcome you to look at it uh, yourself. So if you look at what this does to a couple of different starting points, we're going to look at the initial points. W0 is equal to 1.1i. 
So there's W naught, 1.1i. And we'll look at a very similarly located point uh, at 1i. So let's let z naught be equal to i. So I'm just going to trace out uh, what these families do. If you start taking the family that started at 1.1i, it goes 1.1i, and you iterate that by p, and you end up with about minus 1.2i plus 0.3i. Okay, so that's right here. So you've scooted around here. Oops. You scoot around at this point, and then you iterate again, and you end up at 1.4 minus 0.4i. That's all the way out here, so it's further away, and then down. So you scoot all the way around through this rotation out here, and then uh, the next point races away. So I invite you to check what happens to the next point, so that it runs out towards infinity. So the orbit of 1.1i diverges to infinity. On the other hand, the orbit of z0, so this is the orbit of w0 under p i over 4 of z. If you look at the blue point, you get a sequence of iterates that comes out here. So here is z1. And you come back across to z2, which is about, right, let's see, so 15 sixteenths. z1 is equal to minus 1 plus i over 4. And z2 is 15 sixteenths minus uh, i over 4. So you're kind of negative and down here. There's z2. And then z3 scoots back here a little bit. Z3, and you cross over for Z4. That should be accurate. Let's get this right. Z2, Z3, Z4, Z5, Z6, Z7. So this has completely different sort of behavior. So if you track this orbit, you find that this one is sort of spiraling in. This is the orbit of Z0. Z2, Z3, Z4, Z5, Z6, Z7. This, for all the world, looks like it's coming closer to the origin or some other possible fixed point that we don't know. It's headed somewhere, it looks like, that's not infinity. So it looks like this behavior is already very different. It looks like the orbit of Z0 looks bounded. And the orbit... of w naught looks unbounded. And what we're going to be doing uh, over the next uh, couple weeks is looking at, at sort of why this is happening. Can we predict when they are going to be bounded, when they're going to be unbounded? Um, can we say something about where these points are converging to? Do they have a fixed point that they're converging to? And if they do have a fixed point, uh, or a, rather an attracting point that they're converging to, what is the long-term behavior? So some big questions that we want to answer are going to be things like, question, what is the long-term behavior of the orbit of a point z under a map of the form p c of z. Another question is going to be, how does the choice of parameter, that is the parameter, 
affect the areas of uh, convergence of different initial values. And then there's smaller questions like how fast are things converging and does moving the parameters slightly have big impact on the system or are there places where small changes in the input value can have large changes in the long-term behavior like in this problem where we have what for all the world looks like a small change in the initial conditions that lead to two very different behaviors in the long-term solution. Um, and this is kind of uh, the, the core idea of the study of dynamics broadly. Um, complex and dynamics is pretty interesting, particularly because we can use complex analysis to answer a lot of these questions. All right, so that's sort of your introduction to this. Um, and uh, I'll suggest some of the exercises from the um, rotor exercise or from the rotor notes to get started. And then um, I would also, uh, I'll also be writing up some separate exercises for you guys to think through. All right, uh, I will have a follow-up video posted tomorrow. See you guys.